Delmarva Today with Don Rush. Salisbury moves forward with development of its downtown parking lots. Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester announces her candidacy for the U.S. Senate in Delaware. Ocean City and Salisbury celebrate Pride Month this weekend. And in the second half of the show, we have an in-depth look at agriculture and the dynamics of Bay Restoration. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. In our studio this afternoon is Greg Bassett, editor and general manager for the Salisbury Independent. And on the phone with us is Susan Canfor, reporter for Coastal Point and a contributor to the Salisbury Independent. Welcome to the program. Hey, Don. Hi, Don. So, Greg, I want to start with you first. And um, it looks as if once upon a time, of course, downtown had parking lots filled with buildings. Uh, now <laughs> they're going to be filled again. Is that right? Yeah, we had an epic meeting on Tuesday night. Um, and a lot of the questions about downtown and the future of downtown have come, come, re-come to light. So, as somebody who, you know, works with this every day and every week in the paper, you know, the downtown master plan has been embedded in my head since 2016, but a lot of people are not familiar with what the master plan is. So when there is progress, when there is change, when a backhoe shows up and starts tearing something up, everyone freaks out because of change. So this week there was an opportunity to have a learning moment for everyone, a re-education moment and explain what the, what the plan is for downtown. And that happened with um, an expansion of the sale of another downtown parking lot. Now, the city owns several parking lots throughout the city, and especially in downtown. And it's space that was uh, taken over by the city um, because of condemnations and other issues. But it's not really not the urban, the municipality's role to own property. In a capitalistic society, that property is supposed to be owned by businesses, especially in a, in a business district. So the city has, for years, put put these things up for auction. And they were excited in recent years to dispose finally of some of the last properties downtown with business plans, you know, approved by banks and stuff for these developers. And it fits within the zoning and it's kind of like the the common cause that we all want. So there was an issue to finally sell one of the last pieces of land, uh, lot 15, which is behind the old Thomas Young building where the piano store was when I was a kid across from um, um, uh, where uh, the synagogue temple is. Uh, right next to the old um, uh, the PAL building, that parking lot there. And that is going to be taken over um, by, uh, I think it's Salisbury Realty Apartments is the brand name, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's Gillis Gilkerson. Um, and they need it for their plan to develop Lot 1, which is the big lot in downtown. So Gillis Gilkerson already has Lots 1 and 11. One is the one that's the closest, the big lot that's closest on the east side there. Um, Lot 11 is at the bottom of the hill. Lot 15 is across the street. And that was an occasion for people to really air out their grievances about parking situations, what the future is, what are we giving away to developers, what's going on with the Heroes Home Plan, um, and the uh, Project Horizon, which gives tax breaks up front to developers. Everyone was able to have a sort of a cathartic cathartic, uh, experience uh, talking about this, and the city was able to answer questions. So it's been quite quite an interesting journey here in the last few weeks. So, by the way, in terms of getting these things rid of, the parking lots, and building on them, I mean, you see most of them a moment ago, there is a critique by which some of this uh, stuff is sort of being almost given away, at least that's what the critics talk about, uh, with not only a low price in terms of taking the property, but also with tax breaks and such. Why do you think this has happened? I mean, it does seem to be from what you're describing, this absolute impossible difficulty of getting these things redeveloped. Yeah, well, I think anyone who, you know, one of the things eBay has taught us in the last 20 years is things are only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So that's what some of the critics will do. They'll cite, well, this thing's appraised at a million dollars, but the city sold it for $75,000. What, you know, what's going on? Well, if it's worth a million, you know, it's only worth what someone's willing to pay. And if you think that you should have gotten it or the city's not paying, getting paid enough, then you should make a proposal to develop it is the theory on something like this. You you go ahead and and buy it. Um, So, you know, and that's been the point. It's only worth as much as someone's willing to pay for it. This this has been an issue going back, you know, even before. But I remember it was vivid in, in 1999 when the city sold land at the Port of Salisbury Marina to Frank Hanna for $75,000, uh, and they wanted a lot more. They ended up at $75,000, and he built Brew River Restaurant there. Now, you could argue that Brew River has been you know, a transformational building and business for that part of town, 
uh, has generated m many, many tax dollars in the 25 years it's been there. Um, so was that $75,000 sort of investment on the part of Salisbury worth it? Yeah, you know, I, I think it was. And I think that's going to be the case with a lot of these, or at least that's the hope for case. The other thing is, the issue is uh, parking. And the people, a lot of people said, you get rid of these parking lots, or at least some of them, and where are we going to park? They're not, I think there's some proposal for a parking garage. Will parking be available? I mean, will people have to make an adjustment? And how does that fit into the overall structure of downtown? Well, if you look at the models for, uh, you know, parking. So in any city, like, you know, when was the last time you were in a real city and you saw a open air parking lot anywhere? They just don't exist. They're in garages. There's parking, but it's all hidden somewhere. Um, and that's sort of the same thing in Salisbury. And that's the future of Salisbury. We've got a parking garage, which is incredibly utilized. Um, I park in there every day. It's maybe a third full on a busy day. So there's there's plenty of parking there. But there are people who tell me flat out they will not use the parking garage because they have safety concerns, even though those aren't really basic on statistics, you know, um, really a problem. But in these development plans, it, you know, it's not so much to get people downtown and have them find a place to park. What we're doing is we're adding housing. So through the different uh, approved plans already, you know, we're looking at between 200 and 300, 250 and 300 million dollars in investment uh, and in building. So that's all going to be property that's going to be taxed. There's going to be 700 new uh, housing units uh, downtown, uh, plus uh, 100, more than 100 hotel units. Uh, and, you know, the idea is within 10 years, you know, 2,200 people are going to be living downtown. Now, those people will have their parking spaces. That's all incorporated because that's where they're going to live. Um, but when people visit, it's not going to be, you know, the focus is not going to be like on retail and drawing people to downtown the same way there will be parking for all those people. But, you know, and there's concern that, well, there's only going to be parking for residents. We don't know that. The, the numbers seem to suggest there will be plenty of parking for everyone. But is it going to be above ground parking and the kind of like mall parking or shopping center parking that we're all used to? It's not because it's an urban city area. Finally, on this uh, tack, does this say anything about affordable housing? And if so, how viable is that um, given the kind of pricey real estate we're looking at? Big concern, big topic. And again, that's an economic thing. So um, all those economic matrices are really hard to understand. Now, there's an affordable project, affordable housing project in downtown on the Port of Salisbury, uh, on the uh, the north side of the river there, not far from Brewery River. Um, there's an affordable housing project. But no, in this development, this is all going to be upscale stuff. These are people who are different, um, you know, mobile, young people with salaries, people who work for the university and the hospital um, who are going to be upscale. So there are not great provisions for affordable housing. But there are all kinds of concerns about affordable housing, but there are lots and lots of federal programs and many, many developers and landlords that are building affordable housing. But it's not going to be in the in the downtown area exactly, based on these plans. Um, so that's a concern. But there's still lots that can be developed. There's still lots of things that can go on, and affordable housing could be coming to downtown. But based on these projects that I'm seeing, there's no inf affordable housing included. Since I want to turn to you, and we have this announcement by Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester, she is going to run for the Senate seat in Delaware that's being vacated by Tom Carper. Um, tell me a bit about the about the announcement. Is she the odds-on favorite? She seems to get a lot of support. Yes, I think she is the favorite, Don. She um, is a Democrat, and this week she announced that she's going to run for Senator Carper's seat in the Senate. And Senator Carper, of course, announced his retirement a couple weeks ago. He is supporting Representative Rochester. True to his down-to-earth manner, Senator Carper released a statement in support of her, and he said almost three decades have passed since Lisa, then a University of Delaware graduate student, joined a congressional town hall meeting that I was hosting in Wilmington. With an infant son on her lap and a daughter on the way, she lit up the room and joined in a vibrant conversation that touched on many issues of the day. I was impressed. Representative Rochester made history by being elected the first African-American woman to represent Delaware. That was when she won a seat in Congress and she's been in the House for four terms. Now, she's 61, a native of Philadelphia, the mother of two, and she has decided to continue work on issues she listed in her announcement as the most important issues to Delaware residents. And those are things like, like making sure senior citizens are taken care of, the environment, small business, 
and women's reproductive rights. When she announced her campaign, she said there is still much more to do, and she wants to be there to get it done. And she's going into this campaign, Don, as a popular favorite. She's supported not only by Senator Carper, but also by Senate Majority Leader Charles Schumer, who's a New York Democrat. And interestingly, Don, Miss Rochester, Senator, Ro- uh, I'm sorry, Representative Rochester, had a great great grandfather who was a freed slave. And at one event, she had a scarf that belonged to her great great grandfather with her in memory of him and in memory of how far African Americans have come. And she's certainly a testament to that. So, yes, yeah, she is a, she is the favorite, she is favored, and she is definitely running. She's talked about sort of being between, on the one hand, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and yet uh, on the other with the new Democrats coalition who are, who are centrists. Uh, so she seems to be stranded between those two. Did she have something to say about that? Because uh, I guess she has said that the, they aren't mutually exclusive. Exclusive. She didn't have anything to say about that specifically when she made her announcement, but uh, she does. I don't know her well, but I've interviewed her a few times. I've seen her at events. She, she's been to events like the groundbreaking for the new library in Selbyville in Delaware. And she's, uh, she, to me, she seems much more progressive and liberal than, than she is uh, and, yeah, than she is any other kind of a thinker. And she's very open to people. She likes to talk to people. She's a handshaker, and she, you know, she's always smiling. She's very much like Sandra Carper you know, in that respect. So I, I think we'll see her uh, at least be moderate and listen to new ideas. I'm, I'm sure we'll see her, you know, want to talk to constituents and see what their needs are and see what she can do to help. In a sense, by the way, um, as to whether or not uh, the state senator, Sarah McBride, I understand uh, she may be looking at uh, perhaps entering the fray for the congressional seat. That's what I'm hearing. Uh, there hasn't been any announcement yet. I tried to get an interview with her last week. She was a guest speaker at a church in um, Bethany Beach in Delaware, where I, where I uh, work full-time. And I tried to get an interview with her. She had to go back and finish the legislative session. The session ends on July 1st. So after that, I should be able to talk to her and ask her specifically. But, yes, the, uh, the thought is that she probably will run for a higher seat. She's very popular, very personable, very open, very willing to tell her story. Uh, you know, she's, she's a transgender. She's a transgender woman. And she's very open about that. First, I think the first transgender senator in the country, certainly the highest ranking transgender politician in the country. And very much like, very much like Lisa Blunt Rochester as far as their personalities. So I think that's really good for constituents to have people that are open and friendly and willing to talk and willing to come to the lower part of Delaware. The problem has always been, the complaint has always been that these politicians don't come down to lower Sussex. They're in Wilmington and they're in Newcastle and, you know, the upper areas, but they don't come to functions in lower Sussex. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people think they should be here. And one thing Senator McBride, uh, McBride said when she was here is that they have to do a better job of going and representing where they weren't elected. So I think we'll see that with both of them if they're elected. Greg, I want to turn to you. We have a new president of Warwick Community College, Deborah Casey. What do we know? Yeah, she is uh, – right now she's the vice president of student affairs for Green River College in Auburn, Washington. So she's coming from the Pacific Northwest, and she'll be here in August. Um, Dr. Ray Hoy, who has been the president for 23, 24 years, was supposed to um, have retired on July 30th. But he's going to stay into um, August uh, until she gets here, and then there will be a transition period. Um, but very dynamic. Um, I have not met her yet, but I've looked at some of her YouTube videos uh, as a leader uh, through the pandemic at, at her current uh, place in Washington State. Um, she was selected by a committee uh, who had uh, narrowed the nominations down to three. One was a, uh, two outsiders, including Dr. Casey, and one was a, uh, an in-house uh, candidate. Uh, and they made that announcement on like June 5th. Um, so we're excited. We're going to get you know new leadership at Warwick. Um, we're going to hate saying goodbye to Dr. Ray Hoy. His retirement dinner actually was last night on Thursday night. Um, it was an amazing event at the Civic Center, uh, and I was happy to be there. And you know the community's really going to miss Ray Hoy. Well, what do you think his legacy is going to be? You know, you look at that ex- that campus. Um, you know, he's expanded it. He's almost doubled the number of buildings. He's been very good at, at raising money. Um, and you know, adding to that infrastructure. What, what Ray Hoy has been really good at, what I see, is that businesses will go to him and they'll say, we need welders. You know, we're, there's a welder shortage, and he'll create a program for welders. Um, there's, you know, there's lots of needs in the community, and he has managed to come up and find ways to get donations to build buildings and, and hire um, faculty to train what these, these positions are. It's still, you know, for the 
uh, radiology, um, you know, the X-ray uh, technicians and uh, ner- the nursing program and certainly the law enforcement academy out there. It's absolutely essential to our community, uh, but they, they really do identify the problems and solve them. Susan, I want to turn back to you, because uh, I know you've written, actually, a piece, I believe, for the Salt Bay Independent. Uh, it's about the, the Mariners at Bethel United Methodist Church. We didn't talk about this before, but uh, can you give us a sense about where that is? Because uh, I understand that boats who disassociate from the main church uh, were approved, um, I guess, at a conference last week. I wrote an article for the Coastal Point and for the Salisbury Independent about that. Uh, yes, there were also some churches in Salisbury, including Mount Hermon and a few others. I'm trying to remember their names now that were approved for disassociation or disaffiliation, depending on who you ask. There was a conference in Princess Anne a couple of weeks ago, and there were there was a list of like 100 churches that were approved. Uh, Mariners United Methodist Church in Ocean View was one of them, and I talked in great detail to the pastor there, and that's the Reverend Rebecca Collison. And she said that even though the overarching belief is that the reason these churches want to disaffiliate is because they're anti-gay, because they don't allow pastors to be, uh, gay pastors to be ordained, and they don't allow same-sex marriage, but in her mind, and she was very specific that she was speaking for herself and not for the church, but she said in her mind that is secondary to welcoming everyone into the church, even though she's not allowed to marry same-sex couples, she welcomes them, and she's baptized babies of same-sex couples. She has uh, officiated at funerals of same-sex, uh, loved ones of same-sex couples, and she said that is not a major issue to her. The major issue is that from the, the experts that I've talked to, the officials in the church that I've talked to, they have what's called a book of discipline that governs the entire United Methodist uh, Church organization, and some of those regulations and rules, for lack of a better term, in that book of discipline are not being followed. One of the things is that same-sex bishops and pastors have been ordained, but there are other things as well. And Pastor Collison said one of those things is there was a push to change even the Lord's Prayer, the traditional Lord's Prayer that Christians everywhere believe came right from the mouth of Jesus. And there was a push to change the word father to parent. There was a push to change the, uh, the, the masculine pronouns to they instead of he or she. And she said it was just too much for, for a lot of the churches. There's some progressive thinking, and there's some, certainly some progressive pastors, but it was just too much for some of them to change the very thing that they studied to become, as far as pastors of the United Methodist Church. So yes, they have this affiliated, they have been approved. Probably Mariners, at least, will keep the name, but they, they will have to change you know, their, their stationery and, and their business cards and some of their titles in the church to reflect that they will not be United Methodist anymore. I'm not sure what they will do. They're not sure either yet. And we'll certainly keep you informed as we find that out. But yes, they have this affiliated, and so have many in the Salisbury area. By the way, I also want to check in with you. Uh, we had the passing of baby baby Ava. Tell me a bit about this. Uh, it was a rather sort of sad event since uh, she, yes. she, she survived yes. this crash. Such a sad, sad day, Don. The community received some bad news this week. That little little girl known as Baby Ava, who was involved in a terrible, fiery crash in 2011, when she was, I think she was about 18 months old at the time, caused her to suffer severe brain damage. And because of that crash, the, you know, the results over the years, she had epilepsy and brain damage and some other problems, and she died in her sleep uh, on June, June 15th. She was 13 years old. And she lived in Ocean View. She did live in Ocean City at the time of the accident, but the family moved to Ocean View. In a very tenderly written obituary, her family called her our angel and so sweet. She had just finished seventh grade at Georgetown Middle School through Howard T. Ennis, which is a school for special, children with special needs. And her family also said in her obituary that her strong, resilient personality allowed her to survive that terrible accident, but the brain damage limited her quality of life and her mother and father took care of her around the clock. There was a funeral for baby Ava on Thursday, yesterday. In December 2011, when she was 18 months old, she was in the family car driven by her mother, Anne-Marie Del Rico. Her mother had just stopped to get French fries for the baby, and she was at an intersection in Ocean City when a pickup truck driven by an Ocean Pines resident, Andre James Kaczynski, came speeding up Coastal Highway at almost 100 miles an hour, and smashed into the back of the car. The driver was later found guilty of smoking PCP while he was driving, but he said he needed for severe back pain. 
The baby was in a car seat, but the impact from the crash was so great that it actually destroyed the entire back end of that car. The truck caught on fire. Baby Ava and her mother were, were trapped in the car, and they were able to be freed. The baby was immediately flown to Johns Hopkins, where she had surgery for swelling in her brain. And her, her uh, injuries changed her, her life and her entire family's life. The next fall, the next October, Andre Kaczynski was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And if I'm not mistaken, he did plead guilty. It's a very sad story, Don, about a little girl that her family's remembering as a child who brought such a bright light of sunshine to anyone who was around her. Greg, I want to turn to you here in Salisbury. City of Salisbury is holding its second Pride Parade and Festival. Um, Grand Marshal, I understand, it's supposed to be Magnolia Amplebottom, the same as the last year. Yeah. What are we? Uh, what are we looking at here? Yeah, the Pride Parade is on Saturday. It begins with a parade at uh, two o'clock, and the festivities will continue downtown until eight p.m. Um, the parade begins at sharply at two o'clock. It will start on West Market Street, uh, right there, right near the lot that we were talking about. Um, earlier in the show uh, that was just sold. But anyway, it'll start there on West Market Street. Um, they'll go, they'll proceed north to Main Street, West Main Street, and hang a right, um, go down Main Street to Division Street. The stage will be set up in front of the uh, county courthouse, and it promises to be a great fun event. I was there last, last year taking pictures, and gosh, people were having fun. What do you say that, what do you think that says about the, about, about the city? It just we're no. an inclusive city. You know, yeah. we're all equal here. That's the, sort of the motto. Mm -hmm. um, Magnolia Applebottom is yeah. hysterical. Uh, really enjoy any time I can a interact with them. And it's uh, it's just fun to see all kinds of people getting along and having a good time. And Susan, there will be one uh, in Ocean City as well. Yes, there's going to be the first, uh, Ocean City's first first gay pride parade. Don, I, I looked at some little bit of research before I came on the air with you guys today, and I found out that, interestingly, more than 4% of Maryland Maryland population is gay. And there are 151,000 gay employees in Maryland, yet Ocean City has never had a gay pride parade. But on Saturday, they will have the first inaugural pride parade at 10 o'clock uh, until noon, and it's going to be on South 1st Street. The people who are involved in the parade will proceed for one block to 2nd Street, and then return to First Street. So it's not a very long parade, but I think the uh, the intention is certainly good, and the town is behind it. The Ocean City Council voted unanimously, 6-0, to um, uh, have the gay parade and to allow it. This gay parade is organized by a local businesswoman, Nikki Meinhart. She owns a um, kind of a combination bookstore and winery in Ocean City. And she said the idea is to celebrate the lesbian and gay community and that she's very happy that there's this openness. And uh, Ocean City Council obviously was very welcoming, and she's very pleased about that. She said, Ocean City is, has always been called a town for everybody, but yet there has not been a lot of attention given to the LGBTQ plus community. They keep adding letters, and I keep losing track of those letters every time I, I do these stories, but <laughs> LGBTQ is the, is the general uh, acronym, I guess, for the lesbian and gay community. So she said now there seems to be a more open-mindedness, and that's very pleasing to her. There's also going to be a photo wall at the parade, T-shirts and jewelry and other merchandise for sale, and also, of, co of course, food. So it should be a good time for everyone. Well, we're speaking with Greg Bassett. He's editor and general manager of Salisbury Independent. And on the phone with us is Susan Canfor, reporter for Coastal Point and a contributor to the Salisbury Independent. And we appreciate you both stopping by and chatting with us this afternoon. Thanks, Don. Right. Thank you, Don. You're listening to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Salisbury will be holding its second annual Pride Parade and Festival this Saturday in downtown. You're listening to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. It comes as the country is experiencing a backlash against the LGBTQ community. We now turn to Mark Delancey, Executive Director PFLAG in Salisbury, which stands for Parents, Families, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. So, Mark, first tell me about this weekend's event. Uh, yes, actually, this is our second year. First year was uh, after a long pandemic kind of era, but uh, the inaugural year um, got off with uh, very few hitches, but this year seemed to be even smoother, and the application process was easy, <clears throat> and um, we look forward to actually presenting a lot of some of the stuff that we did last year growing on some of the relationships that we created last year and actually moving forward with some new stuff this year. So what kind of relationships have you developed over the year? That's a good one. 
it's nice to see not only the relationship with the city of Salisbury creating a numerous events in which LGBTQ can be represented in a normal day-to-day experience, but also the celebration of Pride Month so that we can actually showcase some of those achievements that have happened throughout the year, whether it's increasement and involvement in community, awareness through PFLAG itself and our, and our networking of our, some of our programs and initiatives that we have. So uh, a lot of growth has happened on, on numerous fronts, especially those two. Now, this comes at a time when a large number of states are passing laws that would restrict the LGBTQ community. What do you make of where we are? You know, it's, it's hard to assess where we are as a community without looking at the individual perception of that as well. Uh, the community or the um, outer image of what's being perceived and, and right now is primarily being politicized by both the left and the right. Um, so in that aspect, it creates a conflict and people are more, first, or more forced to look at the internal aspects of individually accomplishments that they're creating for not only themselves, but their minor microcosm of a community within small areas like Salisbury. Because it does seem, at least nationally, you are getting this pushback, again, particularly against the LGBTQ community. We've seen issues raised about, for instance, books in the high school and the school libraries. We've seen that certainly here in this region as well. And it does seem to be a, a pushback, particularly against the trans community as well, that maybe perhaps it was 10 years ago. I would not have seen that. Oh, abs- I'm going to 100% agree with you. And um, a lot of that is just based on fear, hidden under the cape of children saying that this is to help children or to protect children when primarily a lot of other issues that are more pertinent to deal with than drag queen story hour or trans people just trying to exist and live. So it's really based on a lot of fear covered by angst and personal inability to cope. Are you surprised at this particular backlash at this particular time? I mean, since it seemed as if there was so much progress being made before? Am I surprised? No. When always there's two steps forward, there's always going to be a step back, uh, which is normal for any growth. But the process, I think, comes from not only, again, the individual growth, trying to get people to understand their own self-worth, whether they're gay, straight, or whatever, but also when you hit that with the backlash of the larger outer image of that fear, you're going to get the pushback that naturally creates with any kind of substantial growth. So uh, until something is more legislatively passed of a permanent nature, it's going to happen. And look at voting rights for women. Look at Juneteenth, for an example. Uh, Until that was actually legislated, and became a moral standard, a lot of these things were not accepted uh, until people understood and were able to look at them objectively after laws were passed. Now, here in this region, we've had some people who have objected to uh, certain books in the the high school libraries and the school libraries. Uh, What do you make of that, Uh, and what do you make of the response by the, the school boards? I think, again, it's based on fear, and I think that there is an existing protocol in place for every school board, every government aspect of that, or local aspect when it comes to the procedures and policies that need to be in place, or that are already in place for trying to look at a book that may or may not be favorable to everyone. And if they don't like the book, they do not have to read it. And for the curriculums that are decided, Again, there's a process in place in which parents and people can decide and voice their opinion on what books are fair and not fair, but to arbitrarily decide what's fair and not fair and circumvent that process is completely illegal and wrong. In those terms, this is a pretty conservative community, certainly voted for Donald Trump, certainly voted for Congressman Andy Harris, a very conservative congressman. What do you make of the fact that you're having these, this event, and you, it's also an event obviously taking place in Ocean City as well, amidst this a very conservative area? I think that it's an educational moment. Uh, I really believe that conservative doesn't need to be a dirty word or a bad word, but in the same process, neither does LGBTQ. Uh, And it's an educational process on both sides. I agree that extremism is bad, but the LGBTQ community 
it has been fighting every single step of the way just to be heard and seen when conservatives look at that as a, as an attack on their individual freedoms when it has nothing to do with them. Because one of the things that strikes me is that there is a great deal of discussion about the idea of not just simply books in classrooms, but in, we have certainly in Florida the issue of not making people feel uncomfortable. There does seem to be this um, widespread this effort. What do you make of that? If you're referring to the, the continued criticism of not only the community, but everything that it represents, of course, I find that offensive in which no one in the LGBT community is asking for anything above and beyond that other people do not already have. When that's being uh, uh, infringed upon, uh, whether it's through books of the library or uh, affirmative care, all of those things are normal everyday aspects that heterosexual or other individuals find themselves to have. So why is it impossible for other people to have that? The problem, I feel, comes from the comfort level that people have of things that aren't their own bias. So when people's comfort levels are challenged or perceived to look outside what is, quote, unquote, their not normal area in which they exist, people feel attacked. People feel infringed upon. Now, it's, it's hard to see, but that's exactly what's happening when people want to infringe upon other people's rights because they feel that theirs are being attacked. Finally, in terms of your Pride Festival, and also we have the one in Ocean City, what kind of impact do you think that's going to have for people who might feel skeptical about uh, the LGBT community or not familiar with it? What do you hope that will communicate to them? Well, I'm hoping that this communicates to the spectrum of individuals, uh, however you want to label that, whether it's economical, uh, philosophical, or however you want to label that spectrum, I feel it's an educational moment, and probably the biggest mission that I try to do as PFLAG is not only to just educate people on terms and understanding of what LGBTQ means and to challenge their bias on how they feel about that, but to look outside yourself and realize that there are other individuals outside of you, and we challenge that every single day past June, past October, and we challenge everyone individually to look at people as being human instead of defining labels. We've been speaking with Mark Delancey. He is executive director of PFLAG in Salisbury. You're listening to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Delmarva Today with Don Rush.